so much fun doing sound bites. Every time I get to be, feel like a politician. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this conference on the science of innovation, which is sponsored by the European Science Foundation and the Science and Technology Options Assessment of the European Parliament. I'm Roderick Flood. I'm chair of the Standing Committee for the Social Sciences at the European Science Foundation. We're very grateful, we at ESF are very grateful for the support and partnership that we've uh, arranged with uh, STOA, the members and officers of STOA, in arranging this meeting. Um, and it does come, I think, at exactly the right time. Um, the Parliament and, and national governments are currently considering the Horizon 2020 program. And in order to encourage you all to look at the Horizon, you will find in your conference packs some binoculars to scan the horizon um, and hopefully to see the innovation that will result from the Horizon 2020 program. The Horizon 2020, as I'm sure everyone knows, um, is intending or is proposed to devote between 80 and 90 billion euros to innovation and research between 2014 and 2020. And its aim is to, quote, to boost research, and innovation, research, innovation, and competitiveness in Europe. It will, quote, provide direct stimulus to the economy and secure our science and technology base and industrial competitiveness for the future, promising a smarter, more sustainable, and more inclusive society. And of course, the 80 or 90 billion euros is only, in a sense, the tip of the iceberg. Um, many national governments, such as my own in the United Kingdom, are planning to spend further billions on innovation and research. And this huge investment in innovation um, carries a lot of hopes on its back. We're told that it will revive Europe's economies. It will promote economic growth and improve living standards and a more sustainable and more inclusive society. It'll make Europe competitive with the United States or India or China. It'll support research in businesses and in universities. It will provide employment for hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of skilled researchers. It won't, I think, raise Europe's spending on research and development to the target level of 3% of GDP, but it will certainly go some way towards that. Now, all this is, is very welcome, and if it were to be achieved, it would be uh, tremendous. But the purpose of today is to raise some questions, to make us cautious. In particular, we as social scientists, I think, want to emphasize that in designing specific innovation policies, Politicians and officials should take account of what we know about the science of innovation, the topic of our discussion today. They should base their policies on what has worked, what will work, on the evidence, rather than on intuition or common sense. Innovation science itself is relatively new, uh, or at least it's newly named, it rests, however, on decades of research by economists, sociologists, economic historians, and people from other disciplines who've always been fascinated by the changes that took place in our world, and particularly in Europe, during the Industrial Revolution. Those changes, those innovations, from the middle of the 18th century onwards, have transformed our world. They have shown us uh, a new world. They've allowed us and our recent ancestors to escape from the hunger and poverty of previous generations, hunger and poverty which of course still afflicts too much of the rest of the world. And the, therefore understanding that process has huge consequences for the, uh, our current economies and for the future. 
But, as I say, there have been decades of research, and those decades of research have been necessary because it has proved to be remarkably difficult, and we need to say this, I think, strongly and clearly, difficult to explain those changes and to say why those innovations occurred. Innovation is not a simple process. In some conventional economic theories, of course, um, innovation and technological change are simply assumed to occur as manna from heaven in the biblical phrase, an exogenous force which doesn't need to be explained but merely exploited. More recent theories have sought to place innovation within the system to see them as endogenous to the growth process. But most economists and economic historians and other social scientists would still ex accept that we don't really know enough about why and how innovation occurs. And this does have implications for policy design and it implies, among other things, that quite a lot of our investment in innovation uh, may not be successful. This is particularly true, I think, for the three quarters of all our economies which don't make or grow things, but provide services. It's very odd in that context that most of the 90 billion uh, euros of Horizon 2020 is planned to support manufacturing industry. Manufacturing industry represents, on average, about 20 to 25 percent of our economies. So there's very little left over in Horizon 2020 for improving efficiency or promoting innovation in the remaining 75 percent of our economies. This is despite the fact that the OECD, for example, sees business services as having been recently, and probably being again, one of the major drivers of our economies. So, as no doubt we'll hear today, we know even less about what promotes innovation in services than we do, or the so-called knowledge economy, than we do in uh, the traditional manufacturing um, industries or indeed agriculture. Innovation sometimes has a bad name. At the moment, innovative financial services are blamed for the current crisis. It seems odd to blame the products rather than the people who designed and implemented them. Uh, but innovations obviously aren't always benign. Um, think of Nobel's explosives, which uh, fund, his, fund his prizes, or instruments of torture. And they're often destructive. They destroy previous technologies and they destroy the lives of those who depend upon them. And we're going to begin, in fact, by considering whether one can have too much innovation. After the keynote address, in a moment, um, we'll try to understand innovation and innovation policy. We'll consider how to improve innovation policy and innovation science. We'll consider the next steps in developing policy. And all our work today is within the framework that I want again to emphasize that social science in the form of studies of innovation can contribute. It is a vital tool in devising and improving policy. And we need, in spending 80 or 90 billion dollars, uh, to consider the social science and the evidence which lies behind it. Now some, some housekeeping. Each of our speakers has been asked to talk for 30 minutes and I'll make sure that they keep to that limit. There'll be a short period for questions after the first session and at the end of the morning and in mid-afternoon, so get your questions ready. To save time, I'm not going to repeat the biographies of our speakers, which are in your conference pack, but I do thank them in advance for their contributions. Now, before introducing Luc Zerta, I'm going to ask uh, my co-chair, Antonio Correo de Campos, the vice chair of STOA, to say a few words. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Roderick Flood. Uh, it was, uh, it's an honor for 
Stoa to host uh, this uh, conference. Uh, especially, uh, not only because it is the, the topic of the moment, I would say the topic of the year, but also because it is, uh, it's a, a, a different from traditional ways of looking at this issue. Well, let me uh, explain what STOA is doing, because uh, STOA means science and technology options appraisal. Options mean alternatives, mean choices. So we look into, uh, we, we are a panel of 15 parliament, parliamentarians elected by five committees, and uh, for the, the whole period we look into the new technologies, new science issues uh, that uh, may need to be discussed uh, to inform our colleagues in Parliament. That's the main, the basic, uh, the basic, uh, we are not doing uh, very scientific assessments of te new technologies. We are discussing them, we are uh, looking into their consequences. Uh, the role of this conference is to give a contribution to the dialogue between science and policy in the field of innovation. The need for an innovative European society arises in the context of global competition. Companies and manufacturing are moving east and south, seeking to capture growth from emerging countries, exploring proximity with their target markets, and taking advantage of lower production costs. On the other hand, in Europe, in the context of an aging population, the much expected economic growth is unlikely to come from increases in cheap labor. Uh, instead, growth can only be reached through gains in labor productivity and through research and development and innovation. To keep its stance in the global competitive context, Europe needs to promote innovation to the extent that it will underpin an economical and societal shift. We need a new economic development model able to sustain more value and smarter jobs and deliver inclusive growth. The way forward for European business is to move faster in bringing to the market new innovative products and services, new processes and organizational structures. Companies must create and lead new business opportunities, sustain distinctive market advantages and capture added value. Innovation in government and in the non-profit sector is also expected to address social needs in education, health and aging and in civil society in general. Social innovation can be as well an important driving force, as it, it has been in the past, as reported here, of evolution and successful social progress. For this to be realized, Europe must promote and embed a culture of innovation that permeates individuals, research institutions, public and private sectors. This needs to be done urgently and in a decisive manner at the only means to outpace global competitors. Failure to act will likely hit European citizens with high levels of unemployment, loss of wealth and social distress affecting the European welfare achievements and the European social model. Much is expected from Europeans from a boost to research and innovation capacity. In order to respond to these expectations, the EU has put forward the Lisbon strategy for a knowledge-based economy. 10 years ago or 12 years ago. More recently, this has been reinforced through the EU 2020 strategy for smart, sustainable and inclusive economic growth. The future program Horizon 2020, which is the most important instrument in science and innovation policy in the European Union, with a proposed budget in the order of 80 billion, I'm sorry, not 90, I would like 90, but <laughs> it's not, probably not possible, is currently being discussed in the European Parliament. The debate here today comes therefore at a very timely moment and fits directly into the process, contributing for evidence-based policy making in the field of innovation. New and effective policies require the appropriate interaction 
between the social and research agendas in social sciences, resulting in a multi-dimensional analysis on the factors governing the transition to a knowledge-based economy in support of skilled employment and of a sustainable welfare state. Social sciences has supported a stronger investment in scientific research for the generation of knowledge. However, an incomplete understanding of the non-linear innovative process might prevent such investments to fall to the profit of European citizens by failing to generate innovative products, services, new production methods and new forms of organization. Questions still remain as to whether innovation benefits can be evenly distributed among social and age groups and among countries inside the European Union. Questions about the most adequate and effective policy measures tailored to the European context. Questions about the positive and negative impacts of innovation and the consequences of misguided innovation. Questions as to do the forms to evaluate the impacts of research and innovation policy in order to redirect resources and adjust policy instruments. These and other relevant issues will be approached today in this forum by experts in the field of innovation. I expect that the discussion will provide fresh insight and a fruitful debate onto some of these very policy relevant issues. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Antonio. Um, we now move to the keynote address um, to be given by Luc Serta on the science of innovation from creative destruction to destructive creation. Um, Luc, as I'm sure you know, is one of the leading figures, in fact, one of the creators of innovation science. Professor International Economic Relations at Maastricht, author of many books and articles on the topic we're discussing today. And without any further delay, I will invite him to give his speech. Um, there's a slight technological difficulty here, a failure of innovation, uh, in that we are going to have to come down here in order to be able to see the slides, so excuse us. Thank you. Apologies for this, but let me just sort of try to uh, give you what I would like to talk about in these 30 minutes and give briefly an overview of, first of all, the science of innovation. I hope this is, uh... yes. And I, I'm using here, I'm so free to actually copy here a colleague of mine at Steinmüller at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex in the UK, who argued that basically we can call today innovation studies science, because basically it represents just like 
material sciences, it begins with the phenomenology, the identification and the delineation of a set of phenomena that come to define the field of study. And to some extent, from that perspective, innovation studies is today a normal science. And to quote Steinmüller, it is more a normal science, not in the sense of physics or chemistry, but it's really a complex and systemic body of knowledge more akin to the biological and ecological sciences than to physics. It, but it is one that can be conveyed at various levels of granularity, and it feeds and it is fed by quantitative measures and indicators, hallmarks of normal science at work. And many of the colleagues you will be talking about or you will be hearing from today, this morning and this afternoon have done a lot of this kind of granular, granular, granularity in the sense of the detailed evidence based with respect to using indicators. The Commission has been very important also with respect to some of those indicators. Think of the various innovation scoreboards and the data underlying some of those indicators, those aggregate indicators. In my talk, though, I will focus very much on what Professor Flaud mentioned in his introductory remarks, that is to say, the way we have translated that evidence of innovation studies into innovation policy. And so in innovation policies, and I'm, I'm using here the, the Guinness old slogan, uh, to be correct, Guinness no longer uses this slogan, even though it is the truth. Uh, there are more antioxidants in Guinness than in normal lager. Uh, but Guinness, in its wisdom, thought that it is not a medical company, and hence it stopped using this advert. By the way, for those of you who are interested, the advantage of the Guinness thing and this advert was that you could get free Guinness if you were giving blood in the various hospitals in, the, in Ireland. But to some extent, just like Guinness is good for you, Innovation policy scholars have been arguing, and innovation policy makers have been arguing that innovation is good for you. And my first claim would be to say, maybe we should be in this policy community as clever as the company Guinness and stop making this advert in terms of policy making. And maybe it could well be that Guinness is not always good for you and innovation is also not always good for you. And the reason why there is a lot of evidence why this could well be true, is of course coming from the evidence. Uh, the evidence at the micro level shows very clearly that we have many innovations, that the majority of innovations, that eight out of 10 innovations fail. And that of course we do have a system by which this failure becomes recognized at the level of firms, simply because firms do, after having introduced the attempt at innovation, withdraw the product from the market, alternatively, that these goods or systems or processes are no longer in use. So if you look again at, at well, probably the most influential project, the success and failure rate in innovation carried out again at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex in the 70s, you can see that out of that emerged a number of insights on how one could improve the success rate of innovations within firms, but still, that the characteristic of innovation being a risky activity was that failure was the norm and that success the exception. Hence, a very simple question, could it not be that at the societal level, similarly, failure is much more the norm in terms of innovation than success? And this is, of course, the link and the challenge, basically, which I would like to address here and which I guess will be discussed here today by many of my colleagues in later sessions. So if we turn to innovation and we, we go back a little bit in terms of the literature and the most important contributions in this area, clearly we have to think of Joseph Schumpeter and his notion of so-called creative destruction. And the notion of creative destruction, of course, was crucial because in the Schumpeterian view, this was the essence of the dynamics in our societies. And this essence was basically that somewhere somebody believed in a radical, incremental uh, innovation, brought it into the market against the advice of many, took the risk and brought in a new innovation which would destroy existing products, existing processes, but society as a whole would benefit from this because this feature in Schumpeter in terms of creative destruction was a feature whereby many, would benefit, society as a whole would benefit at the expense of a few. The few being 
the incumbents. If we think of many of the information technologies which have emerged today, these are fantastic examples of creative destruction. If we look at the airline industry and the novel ways in which pricing has occurred in airlines, again, these are fantastic innovations with an enormous welfare increase in terms of opening up new areas to consumers, reducing prices, allowing a tremendous variety in new services being produced from very high-priced services to low-priced services. In other words, creative destruction has been a characteristic of our societies, and it has been the engine of economic growth. And hence, the line which you find back in the Europe 2020 initiative and many other of the proposals today behind Horizon uh, 2020 are all of that nature. That is that we will invest in research to bring forward new innovations which will have these creative destructive features which benefit society in other words, which could well have costs, but the costs are small compared to the benefits. And the question is, of course, whether we could not, and going back to my Guinness example and to the example at the micro level of innovation studies, whether the opposite pattern is also not feasible, and what I've called here destructive creation. That is to say that we have a process of innovation which is similarly driven by stubborn entrepreneurs, innovators, but which, as such, bring in change, innovation, which is beneficial to themselves, to a few, but is at the expense of society. In other words, has negative welfare impacts on the whole of society. And the question is, of course, this kind of destructive creation, did it exist across times? Was it always there? And is it something which basically is nothing we should worry about because it has always been part of the system and markets to some extent have responded to it and our dynamics in our capitalist systems have basically kicked off or allowed some of these destructive creation features to emerge but very quickly have been sidestepped by the overall growth or whether there are changes in our societies which bring that this kind of features of destructive creation have become more prevalent, more dominant in, our, in the history of our societies. And my claim is that it has. And the reason why it has is related back to these features of particularly information and communication technologies. What I would call this kind of destructive creation, and I've listed here a number of features which I would say are characteristic of such phenomena of destructive creation, are basically the fact that it is short term, it has the feature of free riding, and it's very much applicable to many networks. In most of our societies, we have very important networks, networks in terms of services in particular. It brings in, it pulls in the service delivery. And in the service delivery, we have a number of principles which are basically universal in terms of universal service delivery. We have intra-subsidies between parts of the service delivery between high quality and low quality, between high income and low income. In other words, networks are characterized by a whole set of internal mechanisms to allow the affordability of the network to be delivered, while at the same time having internal cross-subsidies occurring within the network. The impact of, particularly of information communication technologies is basically that it has allowed a tremendous growth in terms of the variety of services, of delivering services in different forms, in different versions. And this is, of course, what has been, I just mentioned it before, in the case of airlines, but in the case of many other service delivery, you see that thanks to the information communication technologies, you can deliver a precise subset of the service according to the specific demand, high, low, medium, whatever, quality features, etc., of that demand also. And that kind of product or service deliv uh, delivery differentiation has been an engine, a tremendous engine of economic growth. But at the same time, of course, it has also had other features, uh, as I will try to show in the next slide. So from this perspective, the 
the existence of these networks and the opportunities, the technological opportunities of information and communication technologies have basically led to a system which I've called here regulation-driven innovation. That is to say that it is the regulatory framework of the particular service which is the engine of innovation. And so what you get is that you will look at the way in which particular features of the service delivery can be deregulated, can allow you by introducing information and communication technologies to pick up certain segments, which in my previous slide are typically the engines of economic growth, but in the slide here are precisely cherry picking. And the cherry picking is basically that you start to produce that particular segment of your network as a service delivery by which the service as a whole becomes no longer sustainable. And you see that in many of these areas, we can see that the full service delivery is becoming under pressure because of this kind of phenomenon. And so this is typically for telecom services, it's for energy services, it's for road transport services, it's for education services, it's for health services. It, if you continue the whole range of service delivery, you can see that in all these network services, this is a phenomenon which we have been confronted with over the last 10 to 20 years. And so as I put it here, in these services, it has become expensive to be poor. You are confronted with the internal transfer, the internal cross-subsidies in these services is no longer occurring because of the opportunities of delivering the particular high-quality service or the cherries in terms of providing a separate service. And of course, in our societies, the agencies which should be there to control this, prevent this, are of course the regulators. And the regulators are there to precisely allow and to continue interact with the new opportunities to make sure that the new service being delivered fit within the purpose of the network service regulation. You should see this to some extent as a continuous battle, a fight between on the one hand the innovators trying to reap the benefits out of particular segments of the market in terms of new product and new service delivery and the regulator trying to control and to make sure that the welfare gains are there for the whole of society. And I would say that in many of these areas, the regulator, of course, has lost out. And the regulator has lost out because he wasn't that well informed about the opportunities. He didn't have the full information about what could occur in terms of allowing innovation in these areas to emerge. And of course, the area in economics, for sure, between competition and regulation in networks is, of course, an area of many debates, hotly debated, etc. It's also reflected, of course, in the whole structure we have here within the Commission with a very strong DG on competition, and very strong DGs on research, innovation, and many areas with respect to information technologies, etc. So, in this sense, the extent to which the network regulators were neither well prepared nor informed about the many new digital opportunities have led basically to a situation that systemic failures could have occurred and in some areas clearly have occurred. So my first conclusion on this and my first point is really is addressed also to STOA and to the members of the European Parliament within the involvement of the Science and Technology Office of technology, the science and technology assessment, is that basically there is a need here to allow for the possibilities of these destructive creation features to emerge, that actually they are much more common than we generally believe. And whereas the science and technology community, the STS community, has always looked at technology from the perspective of needing also to carry out technology assessment, the issue is here that we probably should enlarge this to include innovation assessment. And we don't have an institutional setup to do this. And this innovation assessment is of a very different nature from the science and technology assessment. The science and technology assessment will look at more precautionary principles with respect to new technologies, to new scientific breakthroughs. It will be very much influenced also by ethical considerations and many other aspects dealing with the traditional OTA activities. The innovation assessment would be much more interacting 
with competition regulation and network activities as such, and the potential for some of the overall welfare losses which could operate. So let me illustrate my point and try to convince you along those lines. This is not science, by the way. This is uh, trying to make an argument, so I'm totally leaving the science of innovation in this area. But I'll try to give you three examples, and the last one I will not even talk about because there won't be time, and the subject is probably a bit too uh, tricky to be discussed here in this house. First, really, our ecological and sustainable innovation that consumer growth path which we are witnessing, I would say, every day. Uh, just to give you one figure, in the week between Christmas, the, the, the two weeks before Christmas and New Year, the numbers of iPads sold doubled. Just to give you an idea. The demand of this in terms of spectrum, etc., is of such a nature that you are really in a completely exploding feature in terms of the demand here, not of an ecologically limited uh, air, uh, spectrum, but in terms of the products, you see an incredible boom of some products with questions, of course, in terms of the ecological sustainability of these goods. I'll come back to that in a minute. The second is, of course, financial innovations, which is to some extent the ideal or the example case with respect to what I've been talking about as financial innovations being driven by regulatory frameworks and using the opportunities of information and communication technologies. And the third one is, of course, the institutional innovation of the euro, which is also a very good example of an innovation in an institutional sense with long-term systemic effects, which could well be described today as negative. So this is a little bit my example, and I will be very brief with respect to the second and the third. Mariana Masukato will be talking about financial innovations, and I leave her the pleasure to try to elaborate on this along those lines, and I will not be talking so much about the third one. So, let me, this is, uh, yes. So, let me, this is going too fast, sorry. I think the, yes, back. Yes, well, then I, I'm mistaken. You can continue. And again. So, let me first come with my first example. Innovation, planned obsolescence, and unsustainable consumption. If we look at the, the way innovation has driven consumer demand and the continuous delivery of new consumer goods, we could say that we typically have witnessed at the overall sustainable, sustainable level a process of destructive creation. And in general, we, we look at the way in terms of the evidence with respect to innovation, research, innovation, and economic growth is always positive, is simply by the fact that we assume that behind this there is a kind of creative destruction. But of course, a destructive creation is also possible. And there are very few papers who have actually tried to prove this. One of the most famous ones is the one of Emilio Calvano, who shows actually exactly the opposite pattern. That is, by introducing innovation, you destroy existing products and you force consumers, clients, to shift over to these different products. And there are lots of legal interesting cases. There is the famous case of the Apple batteries uh, at the time in 2000, etc. In the first, uh, in 2004, 2005, in the first iPhones, there are lots of examples in which you will postpone and you will introduce, to some extent, what we call planned obsolescence. Remember the famous case of nylon, uh, which was, if you still remember these little movies of the 50s, where you saw the impact of nylon on stockings, and you saw advertising whereby a truck would carry another truck with a nylon stocking. It was pretty clear to companies introducing these products into the market that nobody would ever buy a new pair of stockings. So what was introduced afterwards by, on the purpose of the companies itself, is to find stockings who would really very clearly break and would have to be replaced. And so planned obsolescence is a characteristic of the innovation process. It is part of the way in which we can convince consumers to shift from product to product 
and indeed to continue their consumption pattern in different areas. If we were not in a situation of having this planned obsolescence, we probably would be dealing with people still using mobiles of 10 years ago, etc., etc. So in this sense, the way we are forced to some extent by the producers, by the services being delivered, to switch continuously further lead us to what Emilie Calvano has described very neatly in, his, in, this, in this model and show that this for, is for companies a very profitable strategy. It's actually the ideal strategy that is that you destroy each other's monopolies but you do this always in terms of the destruction of the capital also of the clients of the consumers. So in this sense, ICT in particular has allowed this opportunity for this continuous further destruction of existing goods through creativity. And so what you have is therefore a basically a regime whereby the lifespan of products is being shortened on purpose continuously to lead you to a continuous renewal of new products, etc., and allowing a continuous growth dynamic existing both at the micro and at the macro level. It's in this sense uh, the issue about what is the optimal rate of innovation has never been addressed really in a sense of ecologically optimal. We are dealing as if continuous and, and I quote here a number of examples here, but if you think of the ICT related sectors such as software writers limiting backward compatibility, electronic good manufacturing ceasing to supply essential after sales services or spare parts for all the products, uh, the legal case against Apple in 2003 with respect to the planned obsolescence of the iPod, uh, etc. Paul David, a colleague of mine in the, in the United States, termed this the innovation fetish Imelda Marcos syndrome. And as he put it in his unique way of putting things, in memory of a famous instance of the uncontrollable obsessive accumulation of more and more pairs of women's shoes, another richly documented fetish object. Yes. So, this is just uh, a little, you see that the economist can be now and then also funny. So, what does this lead to? Well, it leads you to a, what I've called a conspicuous innovation growth path. It's a path of growth which is basically in its environmental impact and its ecological footprint unsustainable in the developed world, but it's increasingly so at the global level. And it warrants, of course, a shift I'm now coming to a set of normative implications which I won't elaborate here given the time. But basically what we have is the, you see I don't have the, I can't move the, the arrow. So what we basically have is a process by which the ecological footprint of our different countries has moved either in terms of a high developed area such as the United States, United Arab Emirates, Australia, and the European countries which you all see there as the green uh, pyramids, countries which have an ecological footprint which is far too high at high levels of development and we then have all the developing countries which are on the bottom left uh, which have low ecological footprints but very low levels of development. The whole issue is how do we get the countries on the bottom into the ecological quadrant which is this works, which is on top there, the ecological footprint quadrant below two at levels, at high levels of development on the one hand and how we get developed countries back into an ecological footprint which is below the two global hectares per capita. Well, this is where you can see that in the research process we have new ways in which one is looking at these things and you have these new concepts such as frugal innovations also in developing country markets. You observe that there are new areas where research and innovation is being directed to which includes both the ecological dimensions and moves away from what I've called here the conspicuous innovation pattern. Given the time I will skip this and I will move quickly to some comments of the next area of the financial um, uh, sector. Well, again here, financial innovations have been innovations. Credit default swaps, securitization, various other products which they were developed on the market could of course be uh, 
uh, it was very neatly described just before in terms of the, in the introduction as being products which were to the benefit of those introducing them, but those introducing them were perfectly Schumpeterian entrepreneurs. And at the moment of their introduction, these were considered as very valuable innovations in a technical sense. The impact, of course, of these products has been, of course, that they have basically enlarged dramatically the risk spread across the globe with a dramatic systemic impact. So, I mean, the, the most amazing thing about the impact of this is that when you look at all the financial innovations being introduced, you basically can, can as I put it here from a Dutch economist, you basically have a situation whereby all the financial, all the structural transformation in the financial sector, all the introduction of the financial innovations have basically led to a situation that today the stock value, the shareholders value of banks, etc., is identical to what it was in 1985. So it is pretty amazing that you have a whole area being subjected to innovation, to creative destruction, to what I would argue destructive creation with actually no share value being created over the last 25 years. So in this sense, again, I would argue that this is an ideal sector to explain it. So what is the solution? Well, I leave this totally to Mariana to talk about uh, later on, but it's very clear that the answers to, this, to the solution are pretty well known. The issue is that basically they are not introduced because of the, all the institutional bottlenecks we have. So let me conclude with just a couple of words on the euro as institutional innovation. It's very clear that again here, the, at the moment of the introduction of the Euro Economic and Monetary Union in 92, back in my own home country and hometown in Maastricht, the whole idea was of course that this would be a radical institutional innovation. And again, at that time, the view of this was that the benefits to consumers, the benefits to the financial system in Europe would be highly, very significant. And there were lots of calculations even made trying to measure this. I've always been extremely critical of this view, even at the time when it was introduced, by comparing to some extent the monetary union as the roof on the European house. The last element in terms of after having the single market, after having a number of policies being introduced, building the roof meant basically that the foundations were on a roofless house with all the consequences, as we have noticed afterwards. But the main thing about this is that, that I w and I, and on which I would like to conclude, is that we can observe that innovation is indeed, has emerged as a science, is being underpinned by evidence, that that evidence is broad and is general and is based very much on this granularity in terms of having indicators both at the macro, at the micro, at the sectoral level, but that the concept itself of innovation as a positive, normative concept, which in policy is translated always in innovation being good for society, needs to be rechecked, needs to be assessed back in terms of what the possible, as I've called it here, destructive creation features could be of innovation, leading to success for a few in the beginning phase to at the expense of many possibly even of society. And the three examples I've given you here are just illustrations of where this seems to have occurred and what are the most obvious examples. Well, clearly our current consumption patterns as being totally unsustainable, the financial innovation as the example of having led us in the financial mess we are today, and the euro, of course, within the eurozone countries as examples of uh, political national interests which led us into a situation where we're stuck in. So, in short, the innovation process described here do not call for less public sector, but rather for a more qualified, independent public sector attracting people with high qualifications, such as our university graduates who are the service of the public interest. We should really accept that the regulatory framework, that the need for this continuous assessing also of these innovation processes is not something we can just leave to the market because the market itself will only select in the short term profitability, but will not look at some of those long term systemic risks. Thank you for your attention.
Yes, but I, I think this, it's, it's a very good question because for me precisely the euro is much more than a financial uh, innovation. It is an institutional innovation in the sense that the whole framework surrounding a sustainable euro was, of course, the famous stability pact. I don't use the word growth even. I'm just talking about stability pact. And that, of course, was the framework which meant that it was much more than just a financial innovation and that it implied a whole set of implications going beyond uh, finance and the exchange between a national currency and a European currency. Yes. He pressed the red button. But he doesn't. But he needs to get Yes, okay, good. Um, I'm just curious how you dis – well, first of all, I enjoyed it very much, your talk, so thank you. But I'm curious on – I'm wondering if it's too limiting, your description of destructive creation. Because I can think of some industries, for example, where in fact an innovation caused the many not to benefit. I mean, just think of the industry shakeout in most industries where you have, say, the Model T forced something like 300 companies <laughs> to exit the car industry. And I doubt you would talk about that in terms of destructive creation. So I think actually you also need to define a term which is really about value destruction and how, and hence you also need to start talking about value. And there's normative and, and other ways one can talk about it, but I think that side skipping that is, is going to open it up to potential criticism. And your example of the money, which disappeared, you know, 25 years of, of money basically disappearing, that starts to get there. But again, I think it's a bit too, um, not superficial, but it's, it's, you know, even there one could question what exactly disappeared. Was it the money or, because in fact my understanding is every time one gains, sorry, loses, someone else has gained, Goldman Sachs has made plenty <laughs> recently, while others have been making losses. So I'm curious on how that figure was actually calculated. But anyway, forget the money part. The real question is how to actually really define destructive creation in a way that you can also talk about it normatively. You need to be patient with this technology. The, well, I would still like, I like this, this simple transformation of creative destruction to destructive creation because the in this in this Calvano model it is not the at the expense of a few incumbents it's not at the expense of the whole of society so your example of the T Ford model would be typically a process of creative destruction in the sense of having benefited the whole of consumers at in terms of having access to much more cheaper cars, etc., in the 30s with the T model, etc. So, the the way it is described in the model itself is actually very neat, and it has basically to do with the positive externalities, which are much more dominant in terms of allowing for positive growth impacts in the, the creative destruction models, as we have them in in growth models of uh, the type which you love, I know, of Aguillon and Howitz and, and others. I was joking. This is a joke, uh, Mariana. But you have exactly the opposite models, where you can then detect that you have actually the negative feature. And the negative features and the examples he gives are typically the examples I mentioned briefly, such as software writers blocking the possibilities for building further on or other after sales limits, etc. And there you clearly see that the consumer is forced to spend more and his products which he consumes are being destroyed. So in this sense, I would still say that this, uh, this notion, and but I'm, you know, it's what's in, a, what's in a concept, et cetera, it's open for debate, but it shows very clearly that this value notion is at the level, in this first example, at the level of consumers. And I agree very much that in terms of finance, you can repeat the same exercise. It might be less, uh, valid, but it still has the same elements that indeed some companies such as Goldman Sachs will have made a fortune out of some of those new products, but the overall system has become more risky, uh, less secure for most of the simple financial consumers, for people investing, for people lending, etc. So it has exactly the similar features of this, this uh, uh, Calvano model. 
So I'm open uh, for alternatives uh, broadening it, but I think as a starter, uh, it might be insightful in terms of highlighting uh, how uh, innovation, etc., can indeed have suddenly, quite suddenly, with the impact of these ICT products and ICT services, a sudden also much more negative aspect uh, in the sense of having much higher risks in terms of the the negative externalities on societies. And I, th I think if you, if you go further in terms of the more sort of non-economic arguments on this, in my view, and I haven't elaborated on this at all, but it, it could well explain also why in society there is a growing opposition to technological and innovation change. Because people consider that, certain, that the quality of certain services they had before has become undermined. If you no longer have the postal services at home, if you no longer have the, whatever, in the UK, the milk being brought at, at the, the doorstep of the house, I don't know if this is still the case. If you have many other of these services which existed, which have become no longer profitable in the overall setting of the particular network, you can imagine that many people will start to consider that this is no longer welfare gains or is growth, but that is actually a detrimental, it's a decline in the position, in the welfare position they were. And I think that could well be behind some of the internal feelings within society, which is increasingly becoming opposite to modernization and to change uh, of the sort of Schumpeterian nature of creative destruction. Let's move on, I'm afraid, uh, to the next bit of the program, but uh, may I Firstly, thank Luke very much indeed for a very provoking and provocative discussion, which I'm sure we will continue to talk about. Um, uh, unfortunately, Vittorio Prodi is uh, a member of the European Parliament and a STOA member, is not able to uh, attend today. So we'll move straight on to the presentation from Alan Hughes, the Professor of Enterprise Studies at Cambridge Judge Business School. Um, He's also not able to be here today. He's in New Zealand, uh, but we have a 25-minute um, video of him, which we will now play. We'll then follow that with um, Merle Jacob, who is uh, sitting ne right next to me and is here, um, and uh, then have, as I said, uh, a period of four discussion and questions. So can we move on now to the video from Alan Hughes, please? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but at least we can use modern technology to have some degree of interchange. The title of my talk is Innovation Policy as Cargo Cult. This is a deliberately provocative title, but I do think it has some particular resonance in the way that policy is often formulated, and there are some important lessons in thinking about the way you can use international comparative evidence to shape international policy in any area. The notion of cargo cult I find particularly attractive in relation to innovation policy because it's an anthropological phenomenon which has been widely studied and it relates in particular to the way in which in the Melanesian islands in the Pacific in the post-war period uh, a number of millenarian religious movements developed. These basically had at their root the idea that because the war had been associated with major material inputs and progress associated with the occupation forces, especially of the United States, that at the end of the war, when these forces withdrew, one could develop a possible religious movement which could appeal for the return of the cargo. These, of course, were deep-rooted movements and they're related to quite deep movements in those islands themselves, but at their heart lay a series of actions which I think can be used to characterize some approaches to innovation policy. The cargo cult phenomenon essentially involved replicating the structures that were associated with the material gain that had occurred during the Second World War. Thus these movements built all kinds of structures. They built bamboo aeroplanes, bamboo runways, conning towers and so on. And the religious movement involved around following ceremonies associated with these structures in the hope that the cargo would return. Of course the cargo didn't return. The reason why this analogy, I think, is very useful is because, quite rightly, policymakers 
have been concerned to try and learn from the international experience of many different countries in developing innovation policy. What I want to argue is that there are some problems in using international evidence unless it's very carefully calibrated and is rooted in quite a deep understanding of the way individual countries' innovation performance works. And in particular, when we look at various elements of policy, and today I'm going to say rather a lot about the role of universities, one has to be very careful in interpreting that role as seen in a particular economy. Now, one of the most interesting features about innovation policy is the extent to which, as in other areas, what is fashionable as policy and comes to have great currency is often linked to what are perceived to be major differences in the overall economic performance of countries. So, for instance, in the um, post-war period and especially uh, in the 1970s, great attention was paid to the institutional structures and policies of Germany and Japan as they became dominant players in international trade, and a lot of emphasis was therefore placed on understanding their institutional structures. Most recently, in relation to innovation policy, international performance of the US economy has attracted a great deal of attention. And in particular, the performance of that economy from the mid-1990s onwards led to a great interest in what might be seen as the core elements of the major change in the rate of growth of that economy which occurred from the mid-1990s onwards compared to the previous two decades. Now, what I want to argue is that the evidence base which relates to this is actually quite fine-grained, but that certain interpretations of it became very important in the policy development arena. Some of these interpretations are in fact being, I would argue, reinforced in the current innovation policy discussion. The central feature which is making innovation policy and the role of universities so important now is in the aftermath of the financial crisis there is great concern about the need to potentially rebalance economies and to focus on the roles that universities can play as so-called suppliers of knowledge or core institutions in the innovation process. So what I want to do is step back a little and unpack some of the arguments that have been used in the past to support a particular interpretation of innovation policy, which I want to argue, although it's more nuanced, is still present in many discussions, including, for instance, the way in which the 2020 Horizon program uh, might be developed. One of the most remarkable features of the late uh, second half of the 1990s uh, in the United States was an acceleration of productivity growth. After a couple of decades of below historic trend uh, rate of growth of the economy, productivity and growth accelerated dramatically back to around 2.5%, and that continued through to the early part of this century. That led to great interest in what might lie behind this productivity performance. And a certain interpretation became current, which I have regarded as a cargo cult interpretation. I think there were three key elements to this interpretation of the US productivity and growth miracle, which fed into the interpretation of innovation policy. The first was that this was rooted in a fundamental transformation of the US economy linked to high technology, science-based endeavors. The second was that this was closely linked to the increased interest of universities in commercialization through patenting, spin-offs, and licensing. And thirdly, this was enormously reinforced by a risk-loving, highly venture capital intensive research and development and early stage development program. I think the evidence does not support that interpretation. In fact, I think it's possible to argue, and I have argued, that all three of those are incorrect interpretations. The first argument, and one which has come home to roost in a very big way, is the interpretation of a period of economic growth based fundamentally around high technology industries. In fact, work by Robert Solo and others demonstrated quite clearly that if you decompose the productivity acceleration of the US economy in the post-1995 period, say through to 2005, the sectors which dominate productivity growth are wholesaling, retailing, financial services, and after 2000, real estate. Now, the reason they're dominant is because, as well as experiencing productivity growth, they also carry large weight in economy. 
And in many ways, what happened was the transformation of sectors, which are not normally regarded as high-tech sectors, into implementers of a whole range, in particular, of ICT-related innovations. So the first lesson here is that the implications for an economy of transformations in technology and understanding deriving from the knowledge base does not show up necessarily in high technology industries per se. A great deal of gain is therefore to be had by the transformation of what might be called more traditional sectors. So the diffusion and use of technologies is just as important, if not more important, than the underlying origins of those technologies. The second issue relates to the role of small businesses in this process. Here again, the evidence is not really supportive of the notion that the smallest firms account for the biggest part of any productivity increase. In fact, extensive work by the OECD and others shows that in any time period, most of the productivity gain is accounted for by productivity improvements in the largest existing firms. And again, that's because of a similar problem which arises when we look at the decomposition of productivity by sectors. Big firms carry a lot of weight precisely because they are big. So if you transform their productivity growth, or they themselves transform their productivity growth, that has a big impact on overall performance. Of course, there is always great emphasis on the role of so-called gazelles, that is, the role that small, high, fast-growing firms can play in transforming the economic system. Now, personally, I find the gazelle analogy quite an interesting one. Uh, gazelles may be quite aesthetically pleasing objects to look at, but if you ask yourself what gazelles do, well, they accumulate in very large groups, eating grass. And occasionally, they will be panicked by a random event, and they will run off in all directions very quickly, but over very short distances, and some of them will be eaten. And then they'll all go back to eating grass again. Well, that's actually not a bad description of the small business population in general, but I never found it particularly convincing as an analogy as to why we should support the small firm sector in general. Now, that might sound rather disparaging of small firms, and it's not intended to be. It's intended to be an example of how dangerous using loose analogies can be in supporting a group of firms in general. There's no doubt that small firms play a particular role in some sectors at certain times, there's no doubt that they play an important feedstock role and often are acquired by larger firms and help to revitalize the innovation process. But in thinking about how to support them, the order of magnitude of their role in the economy and their specific position in particular industries has to be very carefully assessed. The third point I want to make lies in relation to venture capital. Here again, great emphasis has been placed and continues to be placed on finding various ways of subsidizing the supply of finance through supporting venture capital. And most countries in the European Union and elsewhere have made major attempts to support and develop a venture capital industry. But the experience of the United States is a very nuanced one in this area. The most important, about, the most important thing about thinking of the US experience in this area is to note that it is a system and in that system, there are many different core funders of early stage technology development. The third element to the interpretation of the US productivity renaissance has focused heavily on the need to support and develop venture capital markets. This interpretation, however, needs to be a very nuanced one because the US support for early stage technological development contains several major strands of funding which work together as a system. The first and frequently least mentioned part of this process is the role of the state. The state plays a major role through both the public procurement of R&D by uh, major departments of defense and health, but also the use of specific programs such as the Small Business Innovation Research Program, which mandates federal agencies to spend uh, around 2.5% of all their R&D budget on the support of small firms through placing R&D contracts. The total amount of funding which goes through these routes in the United States has been estimated to be the equal of the total amount of angel investment that goes to early stage technology development. By far the least important of funding for early stage technology development in small firms in the United States has been venture capital, 
in the form of venture capital, informal private equity markets of the kind that is often most developed by initiatives in other countries. The final piece of the jigsaw in the United States, again roughly equal in size to the amount put in by the state and by angel investors, is the role of large companies themselves through their R&D programs. Now it's not just the relative importance of each of these that matters, but the fact that there are different stages means that one stage can benefit from the investment at the other stage. Thus angel investors, and to the small extent they're involved in venture capital, can benefit greatly from what is essentially a de-risking investment at the earliest stages by the federal agencies. This means that policies to develop any one part of this chain of activity in a European context, either at a European or national level, has to consider very carefully the connections between these stages. So what does this imply for the development of innovation policy? Well, it's true, of course, that the OECD and others are aware of the differences between countries in innovation systems. And there is a great deal of academic work which has explored these differences. The major challenge is to ensure that the nuances which arise from this are properly reflected in policy. So what I want to do in the rest of my talk today is focus on one particular aspect of this story, which is the role played by universities. And I want here to rely on some evidence that we've collected recently for the UK. In the normal cargo cult interpretation of the role of universities, a rather simple story is told. Research takes place in a university environment. This research is often conducted by people who live in a kind of ivory tower and are terribly interested in what's going on in the outside world. The result is we have high quality, high excellence in terms of scientific assessment of research, but very weak exploitation because there is a gap between the science excellence and the conversion of that into various kinds of public as well as private valued activities. At the heart of this interpretation lies a very particular view of the need to convert universities from so-called traditional universities into what have been called entrepreneurial universities. What I want to argue is that there is a great deal of emerging evidence which suggests that there are extensive connections already between the university base and the commercialization process that the pathways to commercialization are many and varied and don't depend on the particular links through spin-offs and licensing which tend to dominate the debate, and that the major challenge facing innovation policy is not really converting the culture of the so-called supply side of the science base, but developing a range of institutions which can encourage the mutual discovery of interesting problems and the potential exploitation of multiple pathways to the use of activities from the science base in the both private and public sectors. So briefly, what I want to do is just refer to some evidence which we've accumulated in the UK. I want to draw in particular on a survey carried out by uh, my colleagues at the Centre for Business Research in Cambridge, which has covered the whole of the UK academic sector and a very large sample of firms in the private sector. In all, we cover about 22,000 academics and 2,500 firms. Very briefly, what this data shows is, first of all, when asked about their activities involving external organizations, academics are actually quite deeply integrated into their societies. One shouldn't find this surprising because, historically, many academics have been involved in the solution of problems in the societies in which they live. And the most powerful example, which becomes a symbol of this interaction, is Louis Pasteur. In what I regard as an excellent interpretation of the development of science policy in the US in the post-war period, Donald Stokes argued that Louis Pasteur was in fact a much more accurate uh, role model to use in the interpretation of science endeavor because of the clear link between the pursuit of basic understanding and the location of that pursuit in relation to potential uses or considerations of use. So when we asked our academics the extent to which they considered themselves as either basic researchers, researchers, or 
solely concerned with use, by far the dominant proportion regard themselves as being either involved in applied research or research which is of a basic nature but linked to potential considerations of use. And this goes across a very wide range of disciplines, all the way from philosophy to nuclear physics. Of course, there are variations by discipline, so one finds together at the more pure end philosophers and mathematicians, again showing that this is not a matter of the natural sciences versus the social sciences and the arts and humanities. The range of activities are extremely large, and they do reflect the multiple pathways through which commercializing occurs, which is beyond patenting and licensing. Thus, by far the most important set of contacts are initially informal, and they're linked to a very wide range of consulting activities, contractual, problem-solving activities, and also closely linked to the development of curricula, which can lead to the transfer of people through the recruitment at graduate and postgraduate level. And in fact, pathways through people are in many ways the most dominant form of the transfer of knowledge into potential applications as businesses and the public sector recruit new individuals to join their teams. Now, if one asks businesses a similar set of questions about what they regard as the most important contributions and links with the universities, they emphasize a very similar pattern of connections. In particular, they emphasize the role of individuals, recruitment, the ability to develop through informal means to more formal contracting and collaborative research, and in general, a wide set of information flow and exchange activities through, for instance, sitting on advisory boards, providing advice, as well as being involved in particular projects. Moreover, these connections span more than the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines. And this is because the innovation process itself requires far more than technical and scientific knowledge. Research on innovation has increasingly revealed the great importance of a whole range of business functions to the commercialization process. This does involve accessing information external to the firm of a technical kind, but it also involves a wide range of advice on human relations, on organizational issues, on legal issues, on financial planning issues, and the result is that firms report a much wider set of engagements with universities than is captured by a narrow focus on science and technology. So what broad conclusions might one draw from these kinds of developments? And of course, I've scratched the surface of what is a very wide range of emerging evidence in the innovation studies literature. Well, the first is that the link between innovation based on science and technological knowledge and the overall growth of the economy has to be seen as being mediated through particular sizes of firms and in particular the role of large firms who occupy dominant places in most of our economies. That also involves carefully understanding the link between smaller firms and these large firms and the role that the small firms in particular may play in the supply chains and in developing new ideas which are exploited by larger firms, as well as focusing just on the very spectacular growth of a few small firms to giant dominant positions which tends to dominate the rhetoric. The second is that in thinking about the way that innovation occurs, it's important to recognize the many different components of business model development which go to the exploitation and appropriation of value. This means that in particular in developing the case for spending more say on the science base, it has to be recognized that ultimately the appropriation of value will depend on the location and investment decisions of major, often globally integrated players, and therefore raise major problems from a national point of view in ensuring that any investment at a national or European level is the producer of value added employment and growth in the particular national economy or in the EU. Secondly, in relation to what this might mean for the funding of university research, I think it's important that we should recognize the holistic nature of the innovation process and the extent to which that means many disciplines are capable of contributing to this materialistic interpretation of the purpose of funding research. But more importantly, I want to argue that it is the creation of institutions 
which allowed the discovery of connections and the exploitation of multiple pathways to be the most important lesson from the point of view of developing innovation policy. In other words, rather than focusing on the subsidization of particular flows of capital or particular types of business, attention should be paid to the way in which research support can encourage the creation of intermediate institutions which allow a greater interpersonal interplay between academics, between the private and between the public sectors. There are many examples in different economies of the way in which these intermediate institutions develop. In the case of the UK, we are beginning to experiment uh, with some additional public funding for what are originally were called technology innovation centres, but have now been rechristened the Catapult Programme. And these do draw on emerging evidence about the potential role that intermediate organisations sitting on the boundary of the university industry interface can play. The central problem here, as with the more general use of public procurement of R&D, which I think also should be a key element of policy, is to ensure that we can devise mechanisms which can effectively implement the strategies which are developed. The United States does indeed have a very effective public procurement program, but it's based on many years of learning, and it's based on being embedded in a system in which there are many key corporate players linked to the main federal funding agencies and where there is a rich infrastructure of potential pathways to development that are known by very experienced and very professional administrators, administrators of the scheme. So in implementing innovation policy, I think we should pay great attention to the development of the capacities to implement the policies that are being advanced. In relation to the European Union more generally, I think the lessons from the research that I have attempted to provide an overview of is that there will be a great need at a national level to locate particular developments in the particular institutional frameworks and strategies of individual economies. In providing the opportunity for individual academics or universities to bid into European-wide programs, it will be particularly important to ensure that these, in my view, encourage the establishment of appropriate intermediate organisations which are capable of spanning the boundary between the public and private sectors on the one hand and universities on the other, and that particular attention is paid to those areas of scientific advance where it's thought that there are major gains to be had by, say, increasing the scale of focus of investment and increasing the collaboration between leading firms. I would want to end, however, by arguing that the path between investing in these areas and the economic growth of the union and the individual members of it will be not a straightforward one. And in particular, there are bound to be issues in which the potential location of key corporate investments and the commercialization processes that go with it is bound to cause problems of variation in emphasis across countries and the pursuit of national as opposed to wider European issues. This is an important challenge and I think it's an important one that the academic community research and innovation studies can contribute to and I think we should look forward to helping take this agenda forward and informing it with good innovation policy studies advice. There's no doubt that in the period since I originally wrote my first cargo coat paper, that the degree of detailed information and interpretation of innovation policy has changed. There have been substantial inputs by the OECD and others which have emphasized the importance of international differences, and many reports on the innovation systems of individual countries which highlight these differences. Why then should I be concerned to address the cargo cult issue again? The reason, I think, is very straightforward. I've been lucky to be involved in discussions of innovation policy in many countries in the past five years. And there's an important distinction between what we know based on the evidence and what tends to be the dominant rhetoric in the development of policy. I still think it's the case that there is an emphasis on the role of small, dynamic, technology-based gazelles, which the evidence doesn't support. The balance of 
policy support between the role that the public sector can play and between the subsidy of private sector venture capital development still seems to me to place too much emphasis on the latter. The result, therefore, is that in thinking about the way in which policy could be taken forward, and insofar as that involves imitating structures in economies which appear to be doing very well, we must develop a European model which recognises the particular institutional circumstances and industrial structures of individual countries and the EU as a whole, and must ground those policies in a very clear behavioural understanding of what is motivating and driving activity in the research base on the one hand and in the key commercial players and the public sector on another. That's a major challenge but one I think we should welcome. So in conclusion, could I thank you all again for the opportunity to speak to you. It is perhaps ironic that I'm currently in New Zealand which is a lot closer to the Cargo Cult Islands than I would have been if I had been speaking to you in Brussels and I would hope and be delighted to be involved in further discussions of the way this important policy agenda could be taken forward. So thank you once again for your attention. Well, perhaps we can thank Alan in his absence, um, and we can take up some of those points perhaps with um, Mel and um, Look uh, after Mel's um, presentation, which is going to follow. Um, and uh, Merl, as you can see from your pack, is Professor of, in Research Policy at Lund University, and she is going to talk to us, sorry, shuffling my papers, um, about trade-offs in European policy on research, innovation, and higher education. No. Okay, should I, should I go down there? or I Wherever can, you like. I, I can stay here if you like. I have... Yeah, so it's basically if you want to see the slides, but I can see them from here, so... Right. <laughs> Okay, one of the great things about this conference is that we have sort of begun to, to walk the talk uh, or talk the walk in the sense that we are innovating as we go along. We are making, uh, in, ensuring that you in, integrate health and lifestyle opportunities by uh, changing the way in which the conference uh, presentations are given. So some people uh, do it on screen, some people come in front of you, and others uh, do it the more traditional way. Um, today, I'm, I think that my talk uh, fits very well with uh, Alan Hughes's in that I will sort of uh, take up some of the issues that he has taken up, but uh, rather than recovering that ground, what I will do is uh, try to deepen my some particular issues and focus more specifically on European higher education and research. But first, I'd like to begin with the general issue of talking about paradoxes and the policy. Yes, I have the right slide. This is going to be very interesting to see how I'm going to crick my neck here to check these uh, slides as I go along. Now, if anybody who has been following uh, the discussion on European uh, innovation policy or innovation policy in European countries uh, will notice that uh, one can divide member states between those who have paradoxes and those who don't. So, for instance, the smaller states like Sweden, Austria, Norway, etc., seem to be following uh, falling over themselves to present their innovation problems in terms of paradoxes. But i just like to point out that there is actually no such thing as a paradox when we are talking about European innovation. If it is that we mean that the relation between investment in R&D 
is not giving a, a correlation or a, a enough innovation output. Since, to begin with, there are no paradoxes of an empirical character. So that if it is a real problem, then it is not a paradox because it has got to be a logical contradiction for it to be a paradox. So it, to the extent that the problem exists, it can't be a paradox. To the extent that we can claim that the problem exists on the basis of evidence, we do not really know what is the relation between R&D investment and innovation output. So we possibly couldn't even be making an empirical statement about the problem. But nevertheless, I think that this is a particularly interesting starting point to take for my lecture, even though it is a bit complicated, because it, it, it uh, takes up an issue which I believe is at the core of these discussions about the role of the social sciences in contributing to policy. And that is, what is the relation between research and policy? Now, research and policy are basically two very difficult and different animals. On one hand, what you have in the policy world is an intention or an objective at creating order or change of some kind. Whereas for research, we aim at trying to describe a particular phenomena, understanding it, predicting it, and using the knowledge that we gain from these exercises or operations to intervene and make uh, particular outcomes. It may be that we want to create innovation. Uh, it may be that we want to create social change, in which case we want to have an impact on policy. But our goals are slightly different, and the direction which we take to get there is slightly different. Now, this becomes even more important when one considers that policy success or the success of a given policy is not directly dependent on the truth value of the claims which are used to make, to motivate the policy. So that the fact that there is no real paradox doesn't mean that the policies that flow or the measures that flow from paradox thinking or talk may not work policy-wise. So for instance, the notion that there is a paradox has given rise to discussions and policy measures uh, such as the creation of innovation intermediaries. It has given rise to a discussion about the role of patents in innovation. It has given rise to uh, discussions about the relevance of research and development. All of these, one might argue, are concrete policy outcomes, and these have a life of their own and may have an impact, positive impacts on the world, regardless of the fact that the whole notion that motivated them may not have had any basis in fact, or we do not know if it is a factual assertion or not. Now, it's very difficult to find research that starts out on the basis of such weak premises that will be equally successful. And, and this is one of the key issues that we need to keep in mind when we talk about the relation between research and policy. So this takes us to the question of what happens when we decide to steer research on the basis of principles such as relevance. If research follows policy too closely, what may happen is that one finds that what researchers can do or are allowed to do or funded to do will be dependent on what policymakers can potentially predict as problems they may face in the future, or problems that we as researchers can ta sell to policymakers that they, can, that they will need knowledge about in the future. This goes against one of the messages of our sort of general theory of that there should be much more diversity within the system, so that in order to be able to select what is best, we need to have a broad selection base. But if we choose relevance as our key steering principle, by in this process we gradually diminish the diversity or we gradually diminish the selection space, so we have less to select from. <clears throat> 
So this, for, for me, I think what I'm trying to say here is not that evidence-based policy is problematic, but that we need to, be, to, to ensure that while we are creating policies on the basis of research evidence, that we also ensure that the research and the policy trajectories are not too closely connected so that research so that re both research and policy can live or thrive within a context of more options. Because the day that the particular policy trajectory is exhausted, uh, we need to have another knowledge source to, to jump on. So this is not the case of social scientists merely saying on the one hand uh, X, on the, sec on the other hand Y, and on the third hand Z. That's not the point. Next, the next point is that, no, I've gone too far. Yes. Okay, evidence-based policy also presents risk in terms of policy itself. Now, policy thrives on being able to make a certain sort of a number of incremental kind of, of shifts which allow policymakers to, if you want to be crude, say justify past decisions and, pre and, and prevent uh, negative evaluations by making slight incremental shifts and you know, fine tuning. If you want to be nice about it, you can say this is a notion of policy learning, adjustments, etc., fine tuning, etc. Now, this is all based on sort of uh, a, a combination of the discussion about sunk costs that you invest in something and you think that you cannot uh, sort of get rid of it because you've already invested in it. So you, you throw more good money at a bad decision or you fine tune the decision a bit more so that it goes in another direction from which you, you had intended or from which you uh, see that it's going. Now, my argument is that this is a, this is a healthy uh, approach in policy. And, and this is a place where uh, evidence-based policy doesn't really always come into place. That much of the evidence that policymakers are using in this particular kind of adjustment is not always coming from science, but coming from the sort of response they get from their experiments out there. So that I try to introduce uh, mo uh, uh, funding for innovation intermediaries, and then I realize as policymaker, A, that maybe these intermediaries are not uh, my intention was that they were supposed to help small businesses, but maybe they are better focused on corp larger corporations. So I introduce a shift in the policy where I allow small businesses to apply for the money together with big businesses, for instance. And that way I save my hypothesis as well as I adjust to, to cover for the evidence that I get back. Now this evidence may, may come mainly from observation of policy or it may come from research. But the, the point here is that evidence-based policy does not, should not rule out the real experiences and interactions and feedbacks that policymakers have always been used to responding to. Last but not least, uh, apart from the whole business of trying to, to, in, to make your, your base of available knowledge more diverse in order to ensure that you, are f you have policies that are fit for purpose and also fit uh, for the future, one needs to also remember that within the research community, uh, there is a limited amount of knowledge about how to relate to policy. And if you talk about the social science community, I think that there are few of us who are used to interacting and creating knowledge specifically for policy purposes. Similarly, within the European uh, community, member states have different capacities, competences, and experiences in terms of managing to commission research for policy. 
in, just as researchers need to have a competence in terms of how to relate to policy questions and how to provide evidence for policy, so too do policymakers need to learn how to commission research for providing evidence for policy. And one of the very interesting issues in all discussions about research policy interaction is that very much emphasis is placed on researchers learning how to communicate with civilians, policymakers, and non-researchers, whereas very little uh, emphasis is placed on the lack of capacity of policymakers, civilians, business people, etc., to communicate and frame their problems in terms that are researchable. And I find this particular arrogance to be a very interesting and revealing one, it, but it says much more about the power relations between researchers and the rest of society than it says about the evidence that is available. Uh, so I'd like to make a plea that if I were to make a plea for one thing for Horizon 2020, it would be investing in uh, improving the competence of those who are supposed to lead us in the whole business of relevance. If you're going to be talking to researchers about helping you solve your problems, then you also need to know how they think about problem solving. So that, that would be a great step forward if we could get there. Now, from this, I thought that I would take up a couple of so-called trade-offs in European higher education and research policy. When trying to prepare this uh, particular presentation, I had a very difficult time trying to choose what kinds of trade-offs that I should discuss because there are so many of them that it's very difficult to sort of pick out, okay, what are the most important? So I went for a combination of what are the most currently interesting and, what, and, and those that I think are fundamental problems that need to be addressed by our policymakers. And, and one of these, uh, or the first one I'd like to think of, put forward is the, notion, is the problem about expansion versus concentration and improvement. Now, if you look across the member states over the union, you see that over the last 10 to 15 years, there has been an expansion in the number of places and institutions in tertiary education. Within the Nordic institutions, it's, this expansion has been uh, tremendous, as opposed to some of the other member states. Now, this expansion has taken place largely at the expense of uh, the real problems we have with quality at the primary and secondary school levels. So rather than solve the problems at the primary and secondary school levels in terms of improving the quality of the education provided there, we have simply decided to focus on expanding the number of places in tertiary education. Now, there might be a number of different reasons for this, but I think that one of the potential explanatory factors is the increasing focus on the level of the commission on targets, quotas, etc., and the whole competitiveness narrative that has been used within the Commission to discipline countries. So that by in, in injecting member states in a competitiveness narrative where they are on one hand given a number of targets such as the Lisbon uh, uh, target, the target about how much R&D uh, percentage of GNP should be spent on R&D, etc. We, we force member states to sort of compete with each other in, you know, the, we have the competitiveness scoreboard, the innovation index, blah, 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 and everybody wants to look and to see how they're scoring. And then you get, you sort of re relate, um, appeal to our more baser instincts as humans and, and then the issue is we start to play, our policymakers start to play scoreboard politics where the issue is how much, how, how do I look in the scores? And, and this uh, leads to us saying, okay, uh, I'm supposed to have 40% of my population in, at university, university educated. 
So let's not bother with having them uh, properly educated at the secondary school level. Let's just push them up to universities. And oh, there aren't enough universities, or those established universities don't want to let people in. Well, that is an equality issue. So let's open new universities in regional uh, areas where we can then lower the criteria, but do it under the name of regional development. And therefore, suddenly higher education policy becomes a regional development policy. And uh, we can now sort of use this budget to appropriate. And then, you know, you get into this sort of extreme excess where uh, one sort of, you have goal, not, not, not just goal displacement, but uh, the goal starts to wander around the policy map so that you, have, you need 40% of the population educated and then you can uh, do that with regional policy, you can do that, but it's all still higher education and innovation policy somehow. This, this particular trade-off, I think, we have reached a point now where we can no longer uh, continue to sustain it, which has led in the first mover countries to a, a move towards merge, re, mergers and acquisitions within the higher education and research market. So we have bigger institutions uh, because some of these institutions have to now absorb the smaller institutions because we couldn't, heaven forbid, shut down anything because that would mean that somebody was wrong somewhere. So, so we need to have some of these institutions reabsorbed into the, the older ones. So suddenly the old institutions that were the problem are now going to integrate the new ones that were supposed to, to be the magic bullet. Now, I think that to a certain extent, uh, the Commission needs to rethink the whole business about the competitiveness, discipline, and narrative and some of the worst excesses that have been the outcomes of this. It's been very nice to have a way to discipline member states uh, by appealing to the basic psychological instincts of, of the human uh, uh, animal, but I think that we need to also appeal to the notion of a policy that makes sense on the common sense level. Uh, excellence, consolidation, and elitism. Now, I, I like the notion of excellence that has now been introduced in our research and innovation policy because it has had some interesting effects. Among them uh, is one which is at the internal institutional level where we have academics being placed in a situation where some of us are arguing that, ex that we are against excellence. When I was at the University of Oslo, some of the Norwegian academics were saying that they were against excellence. Now, what, what, what is it that makes it uh, possible for an academic to get into a situation where he or she would feel it makes sense to argue in public that he or she is against excellence? And, and the reason for this is that excellence or the policy of excellence has uh, facilitated a certain amount of consolidation and creation of critical mass, which was badly needed in many European uh, science settings because we have had uh, far too many uh, small research groups proliferated across wide spaces and very little um, ability to use the few resources we had to the best of our advantage. Now, some of our higher education and research actors are against the whole policy of excellence for a number of reasons. And in order to understand this, I think one has to, 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 to understand that the, the, the policy of excellence feeds into a number of other uh, complementary measures and narratives which make this particular discussion a very complicated one. The, the, the one of these is the competitiveness narrative as it applies to higher education and research institutions, which is the global ranking scoreboard. Put excellence in a context where institutions are increasingly beginning to see themselves as a number within a global ranking, and one gets a particular kind of politics of resource contribution, of resource concentration. But what also happens with the notion of excellence is that in order to promote more excellence or to promote one's institutions 
position in the global ranking, one needs to then focus on a more elite approach to uh, institutional management and resource concentration, which then leads to some of the sacred cows of European higher education and research being uh, pushed aside in a dark cupboard. And one of these was that higher education and research was somehow supposed to help us to achieve social mobility. And another was that it was supposed to help us to achieve inclusion. Now, I think that here again, the Commission has got a role to play in terms of being able to uh, promote a common but differentiated type of approach to these uh, particular narratives and also to show that some countries uh, benefit more from certain kinds of steering mechanisms than others. Last but not least, but in the same vein, I think that the whole notion of standardization and, acc and accreditation that came along with the open method of coordination of policy in higher education and research, as well as things like the Bologna uh, Accord, have created some positive moments in higher education and research. It has created a certain amount of reliability, predictability. We have standards. Now we know what a, a Bachelor of Arts from Spain has learned and what a Bachelor of Arts from Sweden has learned. But it also uh, has to be compromised vis-a-vis -vis many of the smaller countries' real interest in maintaining a certain closeness of their national education systems with certain particular cultural needs, uh, language expressions, etc. And last but not least, I think one of the issues that we need to take on board in our discussion is that the, the standardization has been good on one level, but it has also been problematic on another in that uh, for the first time we have now a global or a European market, a global European market in uh, higher education and research. We can move students across the union and we can move researchers across the union. I think we need to start discussing what, who are the potential benefactors and who are the potential losers of this increase in mobility in the market. And this might imply that we might, God help us, have to raise the salaries of academics in order to keep them in one place or the other. So we might actually get competitive wages in the higher education and research market. Thank you. Questions or discussion to um, Merle or to look. Um, are there any Anybody like to make a contribution? Yes, here. Um, uh, I was just wondering, uh, I have a little question with the film we saw from Mr. Hughes, where he's um, talking about how to make uh, research institutions more competitive and like he's considering the American uh, innovation development as a as the horizon, I would think, whereas the, the, the speaker before him has shown that the United States have the, the biggest or one of the biggest uh, ecological footprints. And so I was a, bit, a little bit wondering how these two speakers, you know, w what is the relevance of, of the one speaker next to the other in the agenda of this conference? That was my only question. But I, I think this is, a, if I may put it in terms which Merle will not agree with, this is the typical paradox which we are dealing with in this area. I think that Professor Hughes was very much talking about the, the way innovation in, from a vision of a positive vision uh, would lead to more productivity, growth, welfare, uh, would lead to a more effective set of links between the research institutional setup and the actual value creation in the private sector or back to procurement in the public sector. And so he was highlighting uh, the various ways in which uh, the U.S., what is characteristic of the U.S. in particular, how this differs from uh, 
the way we look in Europe at our things. And I thought his, his speech was, was very interesting from that perspective. He didn't touch at all the sustainability issue. And I would say that, you know, it's time for us, and maybe this is where Europe, with the whole green challenge, could be a step further, if we would succeed in implementing it in terms of uh, what it implies, uh, not just in terms of research programs for green technologies, but also at the consumption level. But that is back an issue to the people here in the, of the European Parliament. I have one question for all of us, Mr. Soeto, for you. Today, <coughs> this approach proceeds from geobiopolitics type understanding of life and nature, proceeds from destructive anthropology. Will you talk us something about context, geobiosocial type understanding of life and nature, aspect constructive anthropology, aspect culture anthropology. I wait your discussion. Thank you. Well, I, I think you raise a number of uh, issues which go way beyond uh, what I tried in my narrow economic way of trying to challenge a little bit the uh, positive uh, the automatic positive nature of most of innovation policies. Um, I think in the, in the sort of uh, broadening uh, of this sort of issue to, to some of the issues you mentioned in terms of constructive anthropology insights, well, um, it's very clear that, that the creative destruction nature is in the, was in an economic Schumpeterian sense was very meaningful by highlighting the vested interest forces which in a society will emerge. And they will emerge with respect to the dominant uh, incumbents as we know them and as we, we typically uh, have them reflected in the way uh, societies might decline uh, in a very logical uh, sense uh, because these vested interests are of course there to preserve some of their advantages. I think this was really the contribution of Schumpeter and very much within, of course, his, his, uh, his spirit uh, in which he made these contributions. So we, in economics, in this area, we often talk about Schumpeter I and Schumpeter II, which is the young Schumpeter and the older Schumpeter. Uh, and that very much, that creative destruction nature was very much associated with the period in which he lived within the sort of end of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and all the observations he made at that time with respect to the existing vested interest in those society, as was he saw it very much from the entrepreneurial perspective as questioning the, these vested interests. So I think that, that today um, we, we probably have a, a situation that would be my claim that we have moved so rapidly in terms of continuous new challenges in terms of our society. I mean, you know, for every individual here as a consumer, but also as a participant in society, we are using tools which five years ago we did not control. We, we have no, uh, you know, in terms of the social media and all these other tools which are common, practically in terms of the way we communicate in a digital uh, mobile fashion with each other, these sort of tools are challenging quite fundamentally the way the whole of our social fabric is operational. So whether, and it comes back to some of the questions uh, Mariana Masukato was also asking, whether we still can focus as an economic approach to this whole area of innovation studies is, is very much the question. And I agree with you that there is a need to enlarge this debate and maybe the certainly the two first speakers as economists should possibly step down a little bit and we should invite other disciplines to make much more substantial contributions here. I, I take that very much from your, your intervention. Um, I would like to, um, to thank uh, all the speakers for their uh, wonderful provocative uh, 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 presentations. And 
I was wondering whether the uh, presentation of Mrs. Jacob was uh, like a, a post policy assessment of innovation policy. And on the other hand, I would like to ask uh, um, uh, Luke Suter um, how, we, how he sees how we, we could implement what he, he called the innovation assessment, uh, ex ante, I guess uh, he means, and uh, how, how you fill this in, and uh, whether also in the definition of creative uh, destruction we should not also look at unhealthy markets. For instance, the tobacco industry was implemented many, many years ago, and it created another market for the health industry to heal people, or we even can't heal the people who suffer from this. So there are also creative destructive processes that new markets are created, innovative markets, and they create other markets or create damage in other markets. Uh, is this also part of the definition of this uh, creative destruction. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I call it um, if, if it's innovation assessment because I had actually intended to ask Luke what he meant by that because as far as I'm concerned, uh, the STS uh, old-fashioned technology assessments, etc., include uh, innovation assessment. It's just a question of whether we are assessing beforehand or we are assessing after the, the fact. But if you want to call it an, an, an assessment of uh, the current uh, higher education and research policy, yes, I would stand by that, and, and I hope it is read as such, and, uh, well, I expect nothing to be done about it, but, <laughs> but that's how it was intended, yes. Well, I, for me, the, I still make a strong distinction between the traditional, the old uh, technology assessment as expressed, possibly changed, adapted in terms of constructive technology assessment, and Ari Rip and many others have been working on this, and the particular role these kind of assessment organizations have had with respect to policy decision making, their interaction with the parliaments, and uh, STOA is a very good example of the way this has operated at the European level. Uh, I consider this very much driven by ex ante assessments uh, from a perspective of both the scientific and the technological knowledge and the way precautionary principles could be guiding in terms of setting out, well, analyzing, inventorizing, so to say, the potential um, positive and also negative aspects of particular technologies. When you deal with innovation assessment, I think this is a much more complex and difficult uh, area because I think here the the way the innovation is actually translated into its systemic impact, and that was the purpose of my whole talk, is uh, much more complex and unexpected and with much more uncertainties involved, uh, risks which one doesn't know. So implying there a precautionary principle would lead you very quickly to a sort of completely anti-innovation uh, perspective of just uh, not introducing anything. So here it is really the, the issue whether one has sufficiently uh, viewed the systemic interactions when innovations of the type I try to highlight through this notion of destructive creation are being introduced, what it means for the other segments of the particular service. And it goes back really to the, you know, we all know that both in the financial innovations, the regulatory agencies with respect to finance did not do their jobs. We know this very well with respect to a whole set of other services, service delivery, that ex, if you ex post, it becomes very obvious that they did not do the service in terms of the, the, the function of the regulatory agencies there to control, to make sure that the overall systemic benefits were larger than the couple of creative destruction features associated with it. And that's why I would say that still, um, in the interaction between the triad, between competition policy, regulation, which of course affects very much uh, network services and innovation, there should be a close interaction there. Uh, I think that this is possibly uh, 
a role where the European Union and the European Parliament should be much more involved because it, it goes it's cross border. It's very clear that uh, the individual member states, countries will certainly never be in a position to, to introduce such, such regimes because the innovation as such is, is far too uncertain even in the, in the, in the national dimensions. So, but at the European level, even at the global level, you could imagine that there could indeed be there areas where you could say, well, uh, we allow, we experiment in some of those areas uh, of innovation, but we need to must make sure that the global regulatory framework is there in order to make sure that when we observe negative features, there can be indeed uh, some elements which can be put on hold. Uh, as to your examples of the, the sort of uh, tobacco market and the way this, well, these are the typical examples, of course, where, where you find uh, that society has adjusted, has adapted to some of these uh, novelties, etc. So I, I don't want to say at all that in our regimes we don't have an enormous malleability and institutional response to, this, to the challenges. I'm just saying that it's very clear that when innovation, as I try to argue here, is inspired by existing regulation, and that technologies allow you to circumvent particular features of the regulation so that the debate about why that regulation is there and that actually there are cherry picking is occurring, which offers growth opportunities, that are the sort of areas where we need to have much more that debate. Well, thank you very much. And may I thank on your behalf our two speakers uh, in his absence. Thank you very much for the contributions that you've both made to this, uh, I think, increasingly interesting discussion, uh, which I hope you've, you've all um, benefited from this morning, as I have.